Welcome back to The 100 Stories. Today here at Monash University we're joined by Professor Mike Roper. Mike's a historian at the University of Essex in Britain and he's worked extensively in memory and generational change. His most recent book, The Secret Battle, reconstructs the relationships between soldiers at the front and the mothers they left behind, bridging those two worlds through an intimate examination of letters and diaries. His current work builds on this interest in total war, the emotions and family relationships. Mike's conducting interviews with children who grew up in the interwar period, tracing the transmission of trauma across the generations. In the course of his work, Mike has looked at the potential of history to grip our emotions. In his book, The Secret Battle, he spent over four years immersed in soldiers' letters, diaries and memoirs. Mike believes you can find past traces of emotion in historical artefacts and that parchment, leather and dust that historians encounter in the archives can trigger powerful emotive responses. Mike's been looking at some of those traces of the past today, two testimonies captured in the archives. What can you tell us about those sources today, Mike? We've got a couple of photograph albums here, uh, I think from the one family, and they're very interesting in that, you know, at that time, the mid-1920s, it would have cost probably a year's wage to send someone across to the uh, battlefields. And so we've got clearly a very wealthy family who don't just go once, they go twice to visit uh, you know, uh, to, to Turkey. Uh, and they're there for the opening of a memorial in 1925, I think it is. Um, and you can see uh, there that the visit to, uh, to the cemeteries is just part of a whole tourist experience. You know, they're also visiting Greece, uh, they're going to the Acropolis. It's a European tour with a little bit of war tourism tacked onto it. Now we don't know what personal connection these people would have had um, to the sites that they're visiting. So we have to assume and imagine rather a lot. But you know, it's very interesting to think, for example, we have, a, we have pictures here of uh, them going by horseback up to the memorial and they're being led by what looks like a kind of Turkish guide. And they're in very fashionable mid-1920s gear with you know, sunglasses and uh, you know, an element of the flapper about them. Um, and you know, you've got a couple of pages here where they're visiting the memorials. Uh, and then you turn the page and they're back on board the boat and they're taking pictures of, of uh, their leisure on the boat and uh, bowling in both the uh, photograph albums. So you can see that you know, it's just a part of their life. One can think that these uh, visits you know, have, uh, would be the main point of, 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 the Europe of their tour, but we don't know that. It's very hard to tell from the fragments we have here in these photograph albums. But what is clear is that they are clearly a very wealthy family. They can go in large numbers uh, to, to visit these, these sites. And it's very early form of, you know, First World War uh, battlefield tourism that we're seeing here. And we can see, you know, the memorial's just being opened. We can see that they're, they're still travelling, some by car, some by horse and cart. Um, so, and we also get a terrific sense of the distance that they're travelling because we see the whole of their, um, their, their, their journey on board ship documented in the photographs. We see that it's quite risky because we see there's been a collision between two of the boats and the damage to the boats is, you know, is photographed endlessly. So we see it as part of a whole uh, experience which takes a long time. You know, today we travel by jet and we're there in 24 hours. You know, in those days we're talking about travel which went for weeks and weeks to get to these sites. And they feel like they're pioneers and they indeed they are in a way because for them, you know, the ground is very rough. It takes a long time, you know. Uh, they're very privileged, but they also would see themselves as pioneers, I think, uh, undertaking this kind of journey. Do you think that there would be a huge difference? I mean, these highlight, um, you know, the Irwin family and H Henry Higgins got to travel to where his son lay. And then we also have a huge difference with the families like Emily Luttrell, who wrote begging and begging the government for any kind of subsidy to actually go and see her son's grave. They, they kind of, the stories highlight the disparity between the classes in the morning. When you look at this material, you can see that the uh, War Graves Commission, on the one hand, had an idea that, you know, it was equal service, everybody served, they should be given the same sort of headstone, there should be a uniformity about it, which was quite radical for the time. We're talking about, you know, a class society where division, and division between, in particular, between rank and file and officers, was, was set in, in stone. But here we have, actually, on the whole, burial where everybody has the same entitlement. So on the one hand, the war gives rise to this very kind of egalitarian impulse because the sacrifice is the same for everybody. For every parent who loses a child, it's an equal sacrifice. But on the other hand, social class sneaks back in in so many ways and it sneaks back in 
in not just in terms of who can visit, it sneaks back in in terms of inscriptions and who can pay for inscriptions and how and what kind of inscription they can have. Um, but for Australia, those differences are particularly acute. Now, if you were uh, in Britain in the mid-1920s, it would have taken, and you were a, an, a, you were a factory worker, it would have taken your, a, week, a week of your salary to go and visit the Western Front, which was the closest front to Britain. But that's still a week's wage, and that's an awful lot of money. You know, as I say, you take Australia, and you have a year's salary. So Justice Higgins and the Irwins are part of the elite of the elite, the fact that they're able to make this journey. It's an extraordinary thing. We, it would be hard to think now. It would be like flying Concorde, which you can't do now, but you know the cost of Concorde in the 1980s and 90s to get to America or whatever was ex, you know, extortionate for most people. It's something like that, or by rocket. You know, <laughs> That's how rarefied that kind of tourism would have been for, uh, for people. And of course, the big difference is that for the vast majority of Australians, it wasn't possible to make that journey. Indeed, it wasn't possible for the vast majority of British parents and you know, wives who were left bereaved. They couldn't make that journey even, you know, either, uh, with it being a week's salary. But in Australia, it's particularly a problem that you cannot make that visit. Mm. So what happens is, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which Australians try to make a connection. And the other document which we have here is um, a booklet called Where the Australians Rest. And this is produced in the mid-1920s, 1926, I think it is. And, you know, this is uh, a booklet precisely produced for the purpose that people can't visit the graves which are being constructed um, across all the theatres of war. And in the knowledge of that, the Australian government, no less, creates a booklet so that people can um, have some knowledge of the cemetery in which their loved one might be buried. And if you turn from the cover to the first page of this um, booklet, it says, with the compliments and deepest sympathy of the Minister of State for Defence, Senator Pierce. Now, it's a, per it's a personal kind of, it looks like it's not handwritten, but it's in you know, cursive writing. It's got that kind of personal touch. And this is to supply information when it's not possible for people to visit the site. Um, so, you know, uh, and it's produced in that moment where the uh, War Graves Commission is starting to consolidate the dead and put them into uh, cemeteries, and this often involves disinterring, it often involves clustering together graves that were scattered throughout the battlefields. And on the first, the in, the, on the first page, you see, there uh, is a sketch of a wooden cross, which is one of the, uh, these were often quite, quite often found on, around the cemetery sites, um, and across it it says, from mother. Now, what that tells me is that they're in a moment of transition where the graves are becoming much more substantial and they're being made uniform and these, these private memorials, which were scattered around the battlefields, are gradually being you know, uh, got rid of and there's a sort of rationalisation process going on and people, the bodies being brought into formal cemeteries. And this, uh, this booklet really is documenting that transition. So it starts with an image of the wooden cross, something impermanent, and informal, and it moves in to explain how the dead are going to be buried and where they're buried. So we're in, it documents exactly that process of transmission. Uh, very interesting for that. Another thing which I found very interesting about the booklet is that the War Graves Commission is really trying to be as universal as it can in the way it's thinking about the burial practices. And let me just read a little bit of the booklet out. It says, um, in these cemeteries, the soldiers of the British Empire lie those who came from all over the world to give their lives for the same cause and by whose deeds and sacrifices we now live free. No difference could be made between the graves of officers and other ranks in a war where the full strength of nations was used without respect of persons. Now, what this is saying to me is that they recognise that, the, uh, that the sacrifice is equal for everybody and by that equality they don't just mean rank and file and officers. They're also talking about the whole of the British Empire and the equality of sacrifice across all the nations that contributed to the Allies' war effort. And what they're saying is there has to be a level of, uh, you know, universality about the way in which we commemorate all those dead, despite all those differences that exist across countries in the colony and across social class and across military rank.
much work has been written on why Australia itself has so many war memorials, avenues of honour, honour boards, and each of these memorials carry a burden of names. Why do you think that this is something that is particular to Australia because we are so far away? Or do you, do you know of any other examples in your work? That you come across? Um, I would say that in Britain it's equally important that you have names. Um, I live in a village called Wivenhoe and you know uh, its local church uh, has a cross at the front of it which is you know the first thing you see as you enter the churchyard and it has the names from two world wars and other conflicts on it. So I don't think that the practices are, are don't look different but that emotionally the distance mm. makes a difference. I know that I'm thinking particularly of avenues of honour and of course of all the war memorials that are around Australia and for a lot of people these memorials and in avenues of honour each tree acted as this substitute grave. I know that Bart Zeno in his wonderful book A Distant Grief has written extensively about this practice. Do you mm. think the same was for people in Britain or in other countries? I think that Britain is also surrounded by memorials and sometimes you'll turn up at a village hall and you realise that that is a memorial to First World War dead or you'll visit a hospital and you realise that that hospital wing is a memorial to First World War dead. Um, Colchester has an avenue of remembrance uh, planted along the main entrance into the town. Now I don't know whether indi each individual tree designates a dead soldier but there were avenues of remembrance. Um, so I'm not sure that the practices are hugely different but I think that the way that people would attach to them, when you can't visit the site, when there's no possibility, it is different. And looking at some of the, uh, because my work is on Britain, uh, at the, the memorial stones people put up, and I, I was quite interested in a couple of examples I was looking at where the parents have put the address of their house mm. on the uh, gravestone. And I was thinking that perhaps that might not happen for an Australian soldier because it's too far away. You might say the name of the town, mm. but would you put 36 Fairfax Avenue, uh, Liverpool? I don't know that you would. So I think there's something about the proximity um, of Britain to some of the Western Front cemeteries that domesticates things, rather. Um, and so perhaps there are some differences there, and it would be interesting to do a more systematic kind of study mm. of those differences. But I think. For me, it wouldn't be necessarily the forms that give you the clue. It would be the kind of attachments people made to those forms. And that's something that's much harder to get a handle on than the forms themselves can indicate. Yeah, that's interesting. You've mentioned a few forms there, though. And um, we saw uh, Henry Higgins erecting the cross on the battlefield, and then he comes home and um, creates this beautiful Celtic cross in um, a Dramana cemetery. And Jay Winters actually mentioned that the memorials erected in the 1920s helped people deal with their grief and move on from the mourning that they were experiencing. Do you think that that was the case? Do you think that more memorials served that purpose? Um, I think that Jay is broadly right. But the thing about uh, grief and the way in which people choose to, or the way in which they express their grief, is it's a very individual thing. And um, I think it's right that what happens is that, you know, across, uh, in the 1920s, across, you know, many different nations, there begin to be collective forms of remembrance that develop, which tap into individual grief. And I'm thinking here of, you know, the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior. Um, which from the moment that it's open, there is a sense that this is a site that women will visit. Your most recent book is called The Secret Battle, and of course many of our hundred stories deal with secrets. Do you think, as a historian, there are some stories that we should be more cautious in telling a hundred years later? Are there some that should remain hidden in the archives? I'm thinking with a hundred stories um, of a case of Samuel Meller, whose mother never really quite found out what had happened to her son. Now that's a really fascinating case. I think he doesn't even sign up under his own name to begin with, but under his brother's name, if I'm right, and then, uh, you know, subsequently uh, deserts and then signs up, we now think, under a different name and ends up murdering uh, uh, a military the mil one of the military policemen that's trying to, uh, to, ca to, to catch him. Um, and there's correspondence that goes on between various officials about whether this man's mother should know 
that he is probably the guy who is about to be shot at dawn, he's to be executed for his crime. And the authorities decide that they will just leave her with the knowledge that he was a deserter, but they won't tell her that uh, he was a murderer. It's an extraordinary story and it really made me stop and pause and I wondered to myself and I talked to my mother and other people about this case because it really, you know, captured my imagination. What would you say if I had been one of the uh, AIF or War Office officials, what would I have advised? He apparently, as part of his dying wish, asked that his mother did know that he was about to be uh, you know, executed. Uh, that was his wish. So the officials were not acting uh, with his wish in refusing to tell the mother what had happened. On the other hand, you can think, well, you know, they obviously had the view that the shame of desertion would be better for her to bear than the shame of knowing that he was a murderer and had been, you know, executed. And part of me thinks if I'd been an official, I might still think is it more humane that someone doesn't know in that situation than, than it does? And, you know, when you think back to a society where honour and military honour was so important, the indignity, the shame of what he'd done was so much greater than the shame of desertion. Um, on the other hand, it left her with no resolution and it left her constantly pestering the authorities to know what they, to, to, if they knew any more about him. And I think that that case throws up all sorts of complexities about uh, both what the authorities at the time considered were secrets that should be kept. As for what we think now, well, I think we, we don't have secrets. We, uh, we just try to reveal what there is. And I think in this case, it's not entirely clear. It's not beyond the burden of proof mm. that these two characters are the same man. And I think it's really important for us to keep open the confusion which people felt at the time and the lack of resolution that they felt at the time and that we don't try and prematurely have a neat story about it all. It's messy. It's uh, a very you know, complex and unhappy story. Uh, and it's not, as I say, beyond all evidence that, that this is one person, not two people. Um, so I think that we need no secrets, but we need to make sure that we keep the complexity of the cases that we are researching and that we allow people now to understand how complicated life circumstances were. You know, the other thing about this, 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 uh, this man is the mother writes, well, he, he, su he supported me before the war. Now, you know, looking at that, you think, you know, it's heartbreaking that this man should have been pushed to the point of desertion and then you know, have fallen into such a terrible end. Um, but of course, she's also writing with interest in mind. You know, she would have been given an allotment, money, for her son, which, if he'd been a deserter, would stop. So it's very much in her interest to say he was, he was upstanding, he supported me, because she's losing income out of that situation. So there's lots of complexity to these stories, which it's really important that we keep in the way that we frame them and the way that, that people sort of understand them now. It's the thickness of the past that's easily lost 100 years on. How do we keep that in the way that we represent the war? There's been a rehabilitation in the last few years on the way that we've looked at the Great War and that perhaps we've focused unduly on the horrors of war. And do you think that this charge could be put against the 100 stories? Well, the um, 100 stories pack a punch. They are quite difficult to sit through. I got quite upset. Um, on looking at them. There's something about the, the very spare form, uh, black and white, and they move at an elegiac pace. They force you to slow down and you can't fast forward. So you sit with them and material discloses itself about soldiers and a lot of it is very difficult to take in because it's upsetting, it's sad. Um, so I think that, that it's a kind of memorial and I think that it serves a very valuable function as that. Um, in relation to the revisionism around the First World War, um, I have a problem with uh, that impulse. 
I think that what's happening is that as we've reached the 100 years, the last veteran died perhaps four, five, six years ago now um, in the UK. And I know in Australia it was about the same period ago. And so what's happening is that you're getting the death of the last eyewitnesses. And there's an issue there about the transition from survivor memory to historical memory. And that's the point where historians get in and they try and set the cast. They try and push interpretations one way or another because they realise that is the point where history starts to be made when the participants can no longer answer back. It's a transition from personal memory to kind of cultural memory. And I think that helps to explain some of the animated debates that have gone on uh, about how we see the war and in particular whether we should see it in terms of the sort of narrative of futility. I get rather exercised by those historians who say, look, that kind of idea that the war was futile and mass slaughter and meaningless and lions led, led by donkeys, that that idea dates from the 1960s. I feel strongly about it because I had a grandfather who fought at Gallipoli and who never, as far as I know, had to approach the repatriation authorities for anything. But, you know, he was a pretty disturbed man in his own way. He was a very affectionate, loving grandfather, but prone to bouts of unreasonable temper, um, sort of felt dangerous to be around as a kid, but I also loved him greatly. But he was clearly somebody very deeply marked by the First World War. So when historians come out saying to me, oh, well, the narrative, mar narrative of horror is a product of the 1960s, I go, well, no, it isn't, because I know what my grandfather went through and I know what he communicated to me, and that didn't start in the 1960s, that was there from the war. Um, and I think that, you know, I have a very strong reaction against that kind of, uh, that kind of attempt to, to sort of reformulate the war as, as a sort of, we even have people now who have some idea in Britain of it being a just cause that we should recover. Um, and for me, it's very important to keep alive that narrative of what the war did to people. And so the project that I'm currently engaged in, which is with very elderly people in their 80s and 90s, they're the children of First World War men and women. And they're telling me lots of stories about how the war was present in their childhood, although the war was long finished, but it was still there. It was still there in, you know, fathers that couldn't work because they were physically disabled because they were shell-shocked. It was there in mothers that had worked as nurses and were dealing with the kind of consequences of having, you know, had a lot of, uh, you know, pretty awful uh, experiences to have to deal with. Uh, at the same time as feeling a sense of, of significance and, and, and indeed liberation from working in the way that they did during the war. But the war is present, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, although it's over. And so this idea that it's the 1960s that creates a story of horror there's a family kind of undertow there of aftermath, you know, which we're still, I think, dealing with even now. Absolutely. The whole idea of the 100 stories is the war didn't end in 1918. It went decades and decades on. It did, but uh, I found it very interesting when, when I was looking at the booklet, Where the Australians Rest, mm -hmm. and it says uh, here that um, it has a sticker in it which says Ex Libris, Geoffrey Farmer, on the inside, so clearly it was owned by Geoffrey Farmer. But it also says on the first page, $20. Mm -hmm. Now, that suggests to me that that was in somebody's possession and perhaps might have had a lot of meaning to them. But at some point, maybe that person died and they were clearing out the bookshelves and somebody thought, what's this? I don't know. Let's, just, let's sell it. Let's just give it away. So its value at some point became $20, which isn't very much. Uh, maybe that's the point at which, you know, personal memory gives way to historical memory and then we've got a market value of not very much for what we think now is a very interesting artefact, but maybe it doesn't have the personal significance anymore that it did to somebody. So, you know, that war endures, but on another level, its traces fade. Much of your book deals with the relationship between mothers and their sons that they sent off to war. And of course, this theme comes across in the 100 stories as well. I'm thinking particularly of the story of Christy Campbell and her son Charlie at war and the letters that were between them. Um, but there are so many examples. How do you find that um, these stories of kinship and also of what Jay Winter has called fictive kinship have come through your work? Yeah, well, um, I think that uh, you could use the term fictive kin 
But um, I was also thinking in the book about the ways in which uh, real families still actually support fictive kin, if you like. Um, to give you an example, you know, there are all sorts of networks that come into play when a man dies. Um, quite often his comrade will write a letter to uh, the parents. Um, and so they might be examples of where you might think of comradeship. Uh, or you might think about situations where a man dies and his comrade on his next visit back home, which of course was possible for soldiers in Britain but not Australia, that man will visit the dead man's parents and uh, you know it's part of a condolence process that goes on. So you could think about fictive kin but you could also think about the ways in which kin still supports fictive kin uh, and there are these quite close relations between real kin and fictive kin. Um, so I think that's one response I'd, I'd give to that. Um, my work was, and I think I probably would want to say, that I think that kin, real kin, is incredibly important and I found it rather astonishing that actually people hadn't really thought about well who writes to whom and who seems to be the person who's being written to most of all. Uh, there seems to be a lot more to say about kin still um, and uh, you know for me it was a revelation to turn up at the Imperial War Museum and to sit down with collections and realise oh my goodness they keep writing to their mother. Now that's interesting but it's also interesting to ask them well what does that mean about fathers um, and uh, there's a lovely line in Wilfred Owen's uh, letters to his mother which says something like you know nothing but once what nothing but one three times a week will do from you nothing less than once a week from Colin his brother and then he just says and father question mark and I still don't know what does that question mark mean does it mean he wants his father to write, but there aren't guidelines about how the connection between fathers and sons should be, or what does that mean? Now, when it comes to grief, I think there are similar issues about what the role is for fathers. And, uh, you know, in the hundred stories, there are a couple of fascinating examples of fathers who become very involved in the grieving process and who, you know, like Justice Higgins, who, who, who are clearly absolutely heartbroken um, and very engaged in you know what on earth to do and what should come out of this and becomes interested in pacifism you know out of what's happened to his son um, but it's also the case in, in Britain that you know there's a sort of social script around the grief being the mother's burden so you'll get you know husbands saying I know that my, not my grief can't approach yours so there's a sort of social expectation, if you like, that, that the primary victim is the mother, mm. which means that in some cases I think it must have been quite difficult for fathers to know how to associate with their own personal loss, when in a way they were supposed to be supporting their, their wives in, in their loss because the, the mother's loss was seen as primary. If you look at what happens when the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior is opened, you know, um, mothers are given prime place in the ceremony and they have a place there above widows. You know, socially they're, they're given the seats that dignitaries would have had once upon a time. So the mother's grief, you know, is seen, is recognised socially in all sorts of ways that perhaps the fathers, it was harder to find that place for fathers. So you get very active fathers, you know, who, can, who are expressing a lot about their grief but the, the social scripts don't necessarily give them a clear place. It's interesting too because a lot of the times um, it was the father who was listed as the next of kin and the father who received the medals and in service records you often find um, a note from the father saying give the medals to the mother. So yeah it's, it's very interesting. Also the fathers where if the man I think is below 17 they have to sign off. 21. 21, sorry 21, yes that's right. Mm. They have to sign off their preparedness mm. to let him go. Well, we find that with the case with uh, the Carmen brothers and David Carmen signs a permission form for two of his sons um, to go to war and all three died and he lived with that, I, th I think, a sense of responsibility and also probably just a feeling of remorse that he's allowed his sons to go to war and we see on David Carmen's grave the three death, penny, uh, death pennies of his sons placed on his grave. Thinking back to you know Vera Bitton's diaries, 
when she, she's initially very hard on her father because the father doesn't want the brother to serve. Now, he would have had to sign. Um, the mother is really gung-ho. She, you know, she, she, she can't wait for the son to join up because she wants to be able to show that they're doing their bit. Mm. And the, so the mother and son are in this sort of alliance against the father who's got grave misgivings about whether this is a good thing to do. Um, so, you know, individual patterns in families, they're quite interesting, aren't they? Mm. I think also with the mentioning of Henry Higgins, he's probably the most um, drawn on case we have um, in Australia of a father's grief and there's a few other high profile ones but they're all of a very um, particular class and education level so where it's really hard for us to access the story of perhaps working class or um, yeah, middle class men um, who lost their sons in the Great War. Would it be the same however in general for, yeah. the, for the mothers as well? And I think about the British case where, and you, you probably have similar examples here, you know, for the upper middle class, the, one of the things you did when you lost your son was you, in effect, you were able to publish what we would now think of as a sort of scrapbook of the son's life. So you'll get um, volumes that run up to hundreds of pages, which are all about his letters from public school. They're all about, you know, there are photographs, there are... Um, copies of the letters he wrote home whilst serving. Um, they reconstruct what the extant traces of that life until the death. And, you know, they, these were often privately published as memorial books. So the middle class has all these means at their disposal to uh, mediate their grief and to bring it into a public sphere. Mm. Um, the grief is less known to us and there are less public channels for it in the case of those less well off. In the 100 stories we see a lot of communication between men on the front line writing home or clergymen writing to condolence letters to families. Could you perhaps talk a little bit about um, this process of writing and communicating between those two worlds? Yeah, um, you know when a man died um, quite often uh, the comrade who would have been with him at the time is one of the people who will write to the family and one can only imagine what that must have felt like to have had your own horrific experience and then on top of that to have to compose a narrative for somebody else. It strikes me that on the whole um, men were very dutiful about that. It was officers took that role quite seriously um, and generally speaking I think quite a lot of care would be taken about that. But men often write home to their mothers if they're officers, for example, and a man dies, just saying how awful the job is. And, you know, I think many of them are very young. They're only, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, and probably this is their first experience of, of death, and they're not just having to deal with the consequences themselves. They say, I feel rotten. One man writes home to his mother from a pals battalion saying, could you, could you go and talk to the mother? Because he just finds it so difficult to write himself. And men do it and they feel rotten. So they were very difficult things to have to write. And I think what's interesting is that they can be very different in their tone. Uh, and it partly depended on who the letter was addressed to. I think you find with letters to mothers uh, that men are often quite circumspect and there are formulaic phrases they'll use. And the most important of those is that he died a painless death. Now, Many of us historians, we, we do more close research on these cases, we find that these are not painless deaths. Uh, quite often they can be drawn out, but there's a lie there. They don't want the mothers to feel terrible, worse than they already feel, because for people at that time, a painful death was the thing that most people feared most for their loved ones. So, you know, there'll be often assurance that he died a painless death, there are often things about the man being brave. Uh, one of the examples we've got in the hundred stories is, a, is, a, is about, is a, is about a, a manful uh, death, I think it is. You know, so they're they're very keen to show that the death is not meaningless, that uh, that it's a death that you know, is a soldier's death. Um, now, but what's also interesting is that there are great varieties in these letters. So you might find that on the whole, the ones to the mothers, uh, men are being quite protective on their behalf. But, you know, uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll get uh, letters which are very direct. Um, I've had letters from rank-and-file soldiers who are probably not used to writing that much, and they're very bald. They just give the message as it is. Mm 
they don't you know embellish and hide so much they don't have the linguistic facilities perhaps to to do that that the middle class officer might have uh, but it also depends as I say on, on who's being written to uh, and in the hundred stories collection there's a man called Crow who uh, who has a letter dictated uh, by he by the army chaplain as he's dying and that letter to his wife doesn't hold back at all it tells her he's dying it says he's nearly unconscious it says that he wants to write a lot more um, you know when you read that letter it puts you know makes your spine chill because even now a hundred years later you know you're back in that moment and you're imagining what must it be like to be dictating a letter when you're almost unconscious you know, what would that mean? What would it have felt like to receive a letter which was so poignant in the moment of his dying? Um, so there's a great variety in the way these things, in how they're framed. And, you know, quite often I think also what happens is that there'll be contradictory signals in the letter. Uh, you know, one of the examples in The Hundred Stories, the man writes of how uh, it's the son's very brave and so on, but he's clearly had to carry this man, his legs are crushed back to the dressing station and you know uh, he might have wanted to say that it was a heroic death that he was very popular in the in, in the platoon or whatever but at the same time he's also conveying that the man's got crushed legs and he's carried him back now that would be you know very difficult for a loved one a mother or father in this case to have, have read so you know there can be concealment and revealing and, and things being revealed in the same moment almost despite the the, the writer's own best intentions. Mm.